So my name is Joni Parsons. I am the creator of Revel 11, and we're so happy that you're here today. Revel 11 is all about women, women discussing topics that matter like today, topics that ignite curiosity, insights, and aha moments, and coming together for in-person events here online in Seattle and around the globe. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and take this down so that we can share in just a moment. But I am just so thrilled to end Breast Cancer Awareness Month with this conversation today. We're going to be talking not only about screenings, but what you can do for your lifestyle, your diet, what type of nutrition you need, and so much more to help at least reduce breast cancer in many ways. I have so many friends going through breast cancer right now that I thought that this was a very pertinent conversation and it is at all times of our lives as women. So thank you, I'm really glad you're here. I'd like to introduce to you today, my dear friend, Wendy Ellis. She is also my naturopath and we've been working together for a very long time. Wendy is a telemedicine provider at Genev, the largest online platform serving peri and postmenopausal women. Uh, uh, Wendy is a naturopathic physician, as I mentioned, with an emphasis on issues that arise with aging. She maintains a long-term private practice here in Seattle and holds licenses in Oregon, Washington, and she recently moved to Massachusetts. So it is so good to see you today. Wendy is going to be our host with our other guests. So I'm going to toss it over to Wendy. Welcome. Thanks, Joni. Um, it's We were talking as we were prepping about the connectivity of what brings us all together. And I think one thing that brings us together is we all, you know, we're all aging into this place where our breast cancer risk is increasing and you know we're becoming middle-aged women or we're there and we're sort of moving past that onto the next and you know breast cancer is something that takes up a lot of energy and space in our minds um i i feel there's a lot of anxiety about it uh, cardiovascular disease has a much higher death rate for women but breast cancer is something that we really have a lot of anxiety around and I think it's because we know someone and we see how it can change their lives, you know, the, the way that they move through the world, their job, their relation with themselves and other people. Um, and I feel like it's also stressful for women because we we work really hard to take care of ourselves. You know, a lot of people attending this meeting, like we care about what we can do to better our health and better our futures. And I think, um, you know, the, the anxiety around breast cancer, it's like one in eight women, and we probably all know someone right now going through breast cancer treatment. And I think part of the goal of this discussion today is to sort of educate you on what goes into screening, what things might increase your risk, so you know to be screening more regularly, really to just provide an education so it's not coming from a place of fear, but a place of action. Um, to know what we can do to sort of work towards reducing our risk. But that's also relating to other health factors too, like what we eat and our diet um, and our exercise. And so um, one thing that we talked about sort of leading up to this um, was my own experience, because I think we all, you know, Joni was mentioning that she put off her mammogram when she was going through a restful, really stressful time with her mom for six years because there was so much anxiety around not only making the appointment, but getting there, going there, having the exam, waiting for the results, hoping you don't get that call back. Um, and my experience was my very first mammogram, I think I was 45, and I had pretty done, I had told I had fibrocystic breasts for my whole life. So I thought, okay, that's an increased risk factor. I should probably get a baseline. Plus I had a lot of patients tell me, oh, it's so uncomfortable. And, you know, I just don't like the process. I'm worried I'm going to squish something out, a cancer cell. Um, obviously that, you know, that's not something that happens with mammograms. Um, but at the end of the day, I went in, I had a mammogram. I thought, oh, I'm just going to experience this and be able to empathize with my patients about saying, that's not so bad. But at the end of it, I remember being called into the radiologist's office and the radiologist was saying, 
you know, you have these calcifications and this is a 40 to 50 or 30 to 40 percent risk uh, of cancer that, you know, that you might have cancer. And I just sat there in this dark room with this radiologist with the tears going down. I was about to go on a road trip with my husband to Portland. And I just it hijacked me. It hijacked my whole emotional state for days. So you make the biopsy appointment and then you go to that and that's kind of traumatic. Um, and then you know, you're laying, they used to do it, you're laying down and your breast is sort of hanging through this hole and they're collecting samples and that's what they need to do. But at the end of the day, I went back and as he's doing the biopsy, he's saying, this has a very high risk of breast cancer, 40 to 50%. And I was like, what? You know, no new information and this risk had increased. And so fortunately it was negative and all my subsequent mammograms have been negative, but I definitely put off going like you, Joni, um, when that happened, because I just, I was afraid of what the results were going to be. However, I think it's the most important thing I can probably say today is that if you do your screenings, you do that mammogram and they find a lesion that's very early, it has a 99% cure rate, meaning after five years, there's like a 99% chance that that cancer will never return. And so if we do our mammograms early, you know, I think doing them, whether it's every other year or every year, I think that early intervention reduces the invasiveness of the treatment moving forward. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen um, here and put on this presentation. Sorry about that. Excuse my <laughs> ineptness um, with this. Hold on just one second. Oh my gosh. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Even though I practiced. <laughs> That's okay. That always happens. That's fine. Yes. Um, so, you know, the goal for today is to not scare you breast, about breast cancer. The goal today is to give you more information to know how to approach your screenings and also how to reduce your risk and maybe answer any questions that you might have, you know, pertaining to your own experience or your own, um, you know, reducing your risk. Um, so I'll be talking first for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to be sharing this presentation with Ginger Holton and also Katie Linville. The three of us have worked together in genetic wellness um, in the past, and they're both uh, registered dietitians. And so I'll just introduce them more fully when we get to that point. Um, so the statistics, I think this is important to know. So if we're looking at you know one in eight people at one point in their lives will develop breast cancer. And um, approximately half of those, we know that there are certain known risk factors associated with those cancers. So that also leaves 50% um, for other reasons. A lot of people who come into my office say, I, you know, I don't have any family history. And so I don't feel like I need to get that radiation. But I think it's really important to know that, you know, only about 10%, there's some data saying 5%, some 18%. But let's say on average, you know, 13, 14% of, of breast cancers are genetic and the rest are just sort of de novo. They come from many different places. Um, those risks are associated with so many different factors. Um, some of those are demographic. So what's your ethnicity? Where did you come from? What lifestyle do you follow? And also environmental factors. I think environmental factors is a pretty big factor when you talk to oncologists and you say, why do we have so much breast cancer? I think a lot of our breast tissue, you know, there's a lot of adipose tissue there and adipose tissue is very inflammatory. It can also hold on to things. So those are the things, um, you know, as far as statistics go, but what, what can we do about it? Um, I think in all of the data, the thing that is most prevalent is carrying extra weight. And I think the frustrating thing as a woman approaching menopause myself is that just by going through menopause, we have about a five to eight pound weight gain just associated with our metabolism slowing down and then our fat tissue sort of migrating to the middle. Um, but we have to work, unfortunately, even harder to maintain lean muscle mass because the more weight you carry, the higher breast cancer risk is associated with that. 
Um, one thing about the work that I do with Genev um, is that we work with a lot of women going through this transition and the dietitian, dietitians that are in that um, company, like we know that lifestyle, we know that weight is a huge risk factor for so many things. And so we lean on people like Katie and people like Ginger because making behavior change is hard. And, you know, it's like you go to your doctor and your doctor says, you need to eat more vegetables and you need to exercise more. But when you leave that office, sometimes you need someone like Ginger or Katie to say, how can you implement that into your life? Because life is busy and life is stressful and we live with other people and our calendars are not often our own. Um, so as far as diet, obviously that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today. So there's, I'm going to leave that to Ginger and Katie, but um, Ginger did write this book, um, which I lean on a lot because having a low inflammation diet and more of a vegetarian uh, plant-based diet is a really important part of reducing breast cancer risk. It doesn't mean we need to be vegetarian, but it does mean we need to sort of preferentiate, you know, vegetables in our diets. Um, exercise is a huge one also. And I think part of going into perimenopause is that we're tired and we've gained this weight and our joints hurt and exercise is often something that takes a back seat. Um, but exercise is such a critical part of reducing all cause mortality, not just breast cancer. And so I work with a lot of patients to say, you know, what do you like to do for exercise? And, you know, walking is important, but also strength training. Strength training is going to improve muscle mass and reduce that adipose tissue. But again, there'll be more to come on that uh, later. Um, I think it's really important too to consider the environment. Um, the environment, you know, we're constantly hearing about exposures to whether it's smoke from fires, whether it's cleaning products. There's a lot of data coming out and has been over the years about different products that we're using on our faces, in our hair. Um, I was recently at the menopause conference talking to a gentleman who was one of the chief investigators in the Women's Health Initiative. And he said, you have to start talking to your women, especially the African-American population who uses so many products to straighten their hair using extensions, because he said, they're starting to see a lot of data about the products that we're putting on our on our scalps or on our skin and how that how that it's increasing cancer risk for many different kind, kinds of cancer including breast cancer um, as far as what we're putting in our bodies uh, smoking is a big risk factor uh, across the board for so many things but it really a lot you know for many different cancers including breast cancer you know, obesity is there, you know, carrying extra weight, lack of exercise, not sleeping, that's a big one. Smoking always makes the list, um, and that's smoking anything, whether it's tobacco, whether it's marijuana. Obviously, there's a cumulative risk, and when you stop smoking, your risk will definitely decline. Um, and then alcohol, you know, I, I know this is also a sober October uh, for Revel 11, and you know, so alcohol is such a social part of our lives and we come home from work and we want a beverage or we go out with friends and we just want to disconnect and have a glass of wine. However, you know, even with COVID, I think there was a huge surge of a resurgence of drinking and people found themselves just sort of spinning and staying at home and drinking too much wine. Um, and, you know, fortunately, our bodies start to tell us when it doesn't like alcohol. I think going through menopause, perimenopause, that our bodies sort of definitely experience a lot more hot flashes, sleep disturbance, but alcohol um, intake should definitely be reduced. Um, it's according to body mass, the amount that, you know, the, the FDA or the World Health Organization says we should get for men, it's 14 drinks per week. For women, it's seven drinks per week. And obviously, none is better than seven, but the goal would be to stick under that seven drinks per week. And just for perspective, so um, one 12 ounce bottle of beer would be one alcoholic beverage. One ounce of liquor, whatever you mix it with, that would be one beverage, and then five ounces of wine. Um, hormone replacement. So we could have an entire talk just about hormone replacement in breast cancer. 
But what I, what I will say, and I feel very strongly about is that hormones don't cause breast cancer. So if you had an existing breast cancer, you know, the breast, if you think about the breast, they're full of estrogen and progesterone receptors. And so if you're on hormone replacement therapy and you develop a breast cancer, you know, you're asked to discontinue that because you don't want to sort of fuel the fire. Um, however, there are studies that show that women who are on hormone replacement, when diagnosed with breast cancer, they had better outcomes than women who weren't on hormone replacement. So one of the things, um, you know, when you're talking about menopause and you're talking about breast cancer and you're talking about your risk and you want to consider hormone replacement therapy, you'd want to work with a practitioner that's really educated on the risk factors and the benefits when it comes to breast health and hormone replacement. And so I put a link here for the North American Menopause Society. This is an organization that um, there are, you know, I, I just went to the meeting. I think we had 2000 uh, attendees at the meeting um, in Philadelphia just last month. And the women who are sort of writing, men and women who are writing these algorithms and treatment strategies for prevention or reduction in risk of cancer, they, they make it very clear and evident um, for, so helping you understand, like if I take hormone replacement therapy, what does that do to my breast cancer risk? So I put that there. So there's a lot of people who are in menopause who are dealing with this increased breast cancer risk and so I think it's important that if you go down that pathway, you'd want to work with a practitioner like Genev, which, you know, I think we're all members of the North American Menopause Society, or if, if that's not, you know, we are licensed actually in 50 states through Genev. And so if you had any questions, you could go to the Genev website and, and make an appointment with one of the OBGYNs or one of the dietitians or Ginger, um, if you're looking at, you know, for supportive therapies. But I think it's really important to work with someone who's really educated on the topic so you're not fearful that something you're doing is going to increase your risk of something down the road. So I wanted to really be succinct about the things that you should look for. Um, breast density is something that didn't have to be part of the mammogram report up until probably five years ago, maybe longer, but you know, in my mind around five years ago. And the more dense your breast tissue is, it's, it's a higher risk for two reasons. So one of the reasons is if you look at a mammogram and there's a lot of breast density, that tissue looks pretty white. And so because it does appear white, it's hard to see other lesions. If you look at fatty breasts, you know, it's like pretty black on the mammogram report. And so it's easy to see these contrast white dots like calcifications or any masses that you might see. So I think it's important that when you get your mammogram that you read that report. Um, and so basically I gave you the four categories of breast density. And um, I, you know, before people start to panic, like 50% of us have dense breasts. Leaner, more athletic women tend to have more dense breasts. Um, 10% of the population has more fatty breasts and it will say almost entirely fatty. You can have scattered fibroglandular density. That's about 40% of us. Um, heterogeneously dense, which is a little more dense than the fibrous, uh, the scattered density, that's about 40%. And then extremely dense is about 10%. Um, so again, increased density increases breast cancer risk. Um, and so if you do have extremely dense breasts, you know, I think it's important to think about, you know, what do you do for that? Because, you know, there's a couple things. So I'll take you through these sort of screening tools. Um, so I put these risk calculator, uh, these two risk calculators here, um, because I think it's important to be able to just go there yourself and say, you know, it compares you to the average five year and lifetime risk of breast cancer. And so that you type in your ethnicity, you type in, have you ever had a biopsy? Are there any primary first degree relatives who have had breast cancer? What is your breast density? So you'll need to have that piece. But these are useful calculators just to go in there and educate yourself on the things that go into um, your risk. And then for black women, so if we look at 
who is more affected? White women have the highest risk of breast cancer, followed by black women. And then um, the least or the, the lowest risk are actually uh, Hispanic women. Um, if you have a very significant family history of breast cancer, maybe not just primary relatives or first degree relatives, but you want to look at grandparents and cousins, that's that third link um, on this slide here. And you can that gives you a, a much larger family tree to consider when it comes to your risk. And then the last link there um, was something that I heard on NPR recently. And of course, it was for the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I thought it was a really great article to listen to. And it's given by an oncologist and then also a nurse who works in cancer and then another nurse who actually um, was going through breast cancer treatment. And so I thought that was a, a really good article. So I wanted to put that there. Um, okay, so the types of screening. So I have some women who just say, oh my goodness, you know, I don't want to do any screening. I don't want it to get squished. And so can I just do an ultrasound? So I wanted to take you through the types of screening so you can understand sort of how the healthcare system works. Because sometimes like, let's say someone says, oh my goodness, I don't have a primary relative with, or with, with breast cancer, but I do have very dense breasts. Can I get an MRI? But the healthcare system has a very specific algorithm that you have to go through. And so um, mammograms are recommended as the primary uh, screening, and the U.S. Uh, Preventive Task Force says we should do them every other year. Um, some some say every year, some every 18 months. It just depends on whose guidelines you're following. And so I think that I would cons I would talk that through with your healthcare practitioner to decide, you know, basically how how frequently you should do it. But definitely do not wait six years. Definitely yes, don't do that. And Wendy, I want to just interrupt you really quickly. Um, we have a question in the chat about um, because. Um, mammograms are recommended on a yearly basis. Is there any risks associated with multiple mammograms? So that's a that's a that's a piece that people you know talk about that they're worried about the radiation exposure. And as mammograms have gotten you know as we've advanced technologically, the radiation exposure is less. So this is on a, a future slide, but I'll just talk about this right now. So um, when you go get a chest X-ray. You know, that's a, that's the having a mammogram is about half of the radiation exposure. But that being said, if you're flying from the East Coast to the West Coast, you're getting the same amount of radiation as about a chest X-ray. And so we don't think twice about environmental radiation. We think about the radiation to the breast. But we used to do 2D mammograms. And then we and that was just basically one from the front and one from the side. And now we're doing 3D mammograms, which have a lower radiation, but you get a much better picture. And so um, most of the time people worry about that risk or they worry about getting the bad news and then they don't want to do that. So if you go in and you get your mammogram, sometimes you'll get what's called the callback. And that means that a radiologist hasn't reviewed your slides until after you've left. And so after you leave, you have an independent radiologist who's reviewing those and saying, oh, this looks suspicious. We want to get more pictures of that. Most of the time, callbacks don't turn up anything negative. They're just like, oh, that's a cyst. And usually what they do is they may do more images. They may do an ultrasound to see whether it's solid or cystic. Um, an MRI is the next screening and that has no radiation but it's a lot more expensive and so insurance you know unless you have specific risk factors or your mom had a BRCA you know genetic increase and or ovarian cancer if you have a high cancer risk and you have a primary degree relative with breast cancer they may pay for an MRI sometimes if someone if women have you know, if they're willing to pay out of pocket for an MRI, it might be useful if you have extremely dense breasts and you have more risk factors for that. Because there are other risk factors, like if you started your menses, you know, too early, you know, more estrogen exposure. If you had children much later in life, if you didn't have any children. I mean, I kind of 
I call these non-modifiable risk factors because we, I don't want to shame women around, oh, you didn't have 12 children, so your risk is going to be higher. So those are just the things to consider, but those go into the calculator. Um, so this is just data on what we just talked about. So the radiation exposure is it's, it's lower um, and we get more radiation just by flying. Um, so are there specific questions? I wanna make sure that we leave time. So. I, if you have any questions for me, I did put my website there, there is an email there, but I'm going to pass it on over to Katie. Um, Katie Linville, she is a registered dietitian. She has more than 10 years of experience working in women's health and um, with women going through cancer. Um, she holds a certificate in oncology and through her work with Genev, um, you know, she's working not only with women going through this transition to menopause, but also women who have experienced breast cancer and so, who are still dealing with that. So I'm going to pass this on over to Katie. Thanks, Wendy. Yes. So I'm going to touch on the nutrition and physical activity perspectives and what we know can be helpful. And in my work at Genev, I do work with patients who have, who are in, you know, midlife menopause, perhaps perimenopause, who may also be going through a breast cancer diagnosis or are a cancer survivor post-treatment. There's several different situations. Um, also I've worked with people who have a family history and they don't personally have breast cancer, but want to do everything that they can to ensure that they reduce the risk of breast cancer as much as possible. So luckily what we do know is that research does show that there, there's a lot we can do from the lifestyle perspective to reduce overall cancer risk, but particularly with breast cancer. And one resource that I share with patients commonly at Genev, both in general, but definitely if we're focused on cancer risk reduction is this beautiful menopause healthy plate you see here that is envisioning what balance looks like with nutrition. And I'll call out some key components that are extra important to consider when thinking of reducing cancer risk in general. Um, but what we're looking for are a lean source of protein with meals. You can see uh, in the top right section, about a fourth of the plate three to four ounces of a lean protein source that could be salmon. It could be turkey, chicken, uh, tofu, uh, beans, lentils are great plant-based sources in general, a plant-based way of eating is, is so supportive. And Wendy briefly mentioned that earlier. Um, and Ginger's going to talk more about what all of that looks like here in a few minutes as well. Um, but ensuring we're getting a good quality source of protein with our meals and including a fiber rich carbohydrate source. We ha also have it at about, you know, a fourth of the plate or so. Um, that's gonna be so supportive for overall health. That could be um, fruits, that could be whole grain products, potatoes, sweet potatoes, things like that. And also you'll see here, half of this plate is vegetables, which to me, that, that can be seem, uh, like quite a lot of vegetables, right? But, you know, it doesn't have to be perfectly like, oh, you've got to get half of the plate. Any small increase can be supportive. And one thing you'll find if you ever work with one of us as a dietitian um, on these, these goals and factors related to focusing on reducing cancer risk is that we meet you where you're at. We hear your story and we also focus on what what can it look like to slowly work toward increasing vegetables or, you know, including more protein, including healthy fats. We typically will meet, meet with folks um, once every two weeks or so and do check-ins in between for accountability and support. Um, and so just know that we don't expect perfection in any way. None of us are perfect, but slow, uh, change toward what we're looking for with balance is going to be supportive, um, including the healthy fats like nuts, 
avocado, olives, olive oil is wonderful. And I did see the question around soy and for whole so soy foods, that's not a typo. Oh, what I mean by okay. that is what we're looking at are foods that are from a whole foods base rather than processed. So you might see a lot of soy products on the market, um, soy veggie burgers, things like that. And not all of those I would consider an awful choice. However, things like tofu, soy milk, edamame are great to include. And there's a lot of controversy out there and questions around soy mm -hmm. and if it increases cancer risk or, you know, what's the deal. Um, and so for, from what we're seeing in research over the past several years is that if you include two to three servings, which that could look like half a cup of tofu, half a cup of edamame as one serving or a one cup of soy milk, um, if you include two to three servings on a regular basis, mm -hmm. it is seen to be safe, even in those with estrogen positive or, you know, hormone receptive cancers, uh, it may even reduce breast cancer risk. So of course we don't want to overdo it with anything and particularly soy as well. Um, but including two to three servings can be helpful. And that's, that's something we look at too, uh, with, managing menopause symptoms. Sometimes it can be helpful when eaten consistently to help manage menopause symptoms like hot flashes, things like that, which also can be part of an experience with breast cancer treatment. Um, so, Katie, thank you for the clarification on that. I am, I eat mostly a, a veggie based diet and I eat a lot of soy food, um, soy products. And one of the things with soy, it's recommended that you should eat organic soy. Is that correct? Ideal. Yeah, I would. I would if you could. Um, there's a lot to consider with food in general, our access, you know, the cost, everything. Um, but I think organic might be ideal if possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. I wanted to focus also on physical activity for cancer redu uh, risk reduction, because this is another topic we might hear about often and wonder, okay, how much exercise do I need to be getting? What could that actually look like? And I do think that uh, there's a lot to consider here. First of all, staying active can really help with our quality of life, our mental health, which I think is huge across the board, whether we're in a cancer treatment or just anywhere in life we want to focus on improving our quality of life any way we can. Um, physical activity can help support weight maintenance, which there can be connections with our weight and cancer risk reduction. It helps to strengthen the immune system unless we're way overdoing it with exercise. And that's where working with a dietitian or physical therapist, you know, somebody like that, a uh, personal trainer, if they are, have good credentials, could be supportive in helping you understand what does this look like for me? Um, it can for some help manage insulin levels, manage inflammation, um, keeping inflammation lower is a huge goal as well. So I've included what the general guidelines are. They suggest 150 to 300 minutes of moderate activity, or if it's vigorous activity, 75 to 150 minutes. So to give you a visual of what that could look like with walking, um, 30 minutes of walking a day for six days out of the week would put you around 180 minutes. Um, to get to that, that max of 300, they suggest that would be a 50 minute walk six days a week. So uh, it doesn't not, it does not have to be walking. There's so many types of exercise we can focus on. And I mean, you have to consider too, do you have a history of injury risk? Um, what's your interest? We, I want you to focus on exercise that you actually enjoy doing versus forcing yourself to go running, you know, every morning at 6 a.m. If that's not something you're interested in, um, you got to consider access. What, what do you have access to, but also, um, yeah, overall, what does your week look like? How can you fit that in? And often, I suggest starting slow and that is because we don't want to jump right into an intense 
exercise program if we haven't been working out at all, because that could increase injury risk for one. Um, so a lot to consider there, but I have included what some examples are of moderate intensity versus vigorous intensity activities. Um, and then they, the other recommendation is thinking about muscle strengthening. So weight bearing exercise twice, twice a week, ideally. And again, maybe you need to start slower here, maybe one day a week to start. Um, again, this is where I, I recommend working with a professional who can really provide you that insight and guidance based on your story, your experience. Um, but we do find that to be helpful for reducing risk. And um, if you do have any other questions that are coming up as I'm talking through this, feel free to chat them in. But if you wanted to get more specific, one other note here, Awesome. Uh, Joni starting weight training tomorrow. Love to see that. That's great. Um, one other thing to consider if you're curious, you know, is what I'm doing moderate activity versus vigorous? I mean, some people might want to look at heart rate. There are heart rate calculators. You know, a lot of us these days wear an Apple watch or a Fitbit that tells us our heart rate and there are heart rate zones. Um, Ace fitness, which I can make sure that links included does give some guidelines on heart rate zone calculators. Um, it might be something to work with again, one-on-one -on -one with a professional to determine, am I meeting, you know, that moderate activity or that vigorous activity? Um, but our heart rate goals do vary, um, depending on our age. So something to consider individually there. And then the next slide. Oh, I love this question. Is it true that protein powder contains hormones that increase the risk of breast cancer? So I will say with protein powders, uh, not all are made equally, right? Some may be of wonderful quality and others, not so much. It can be hard to know, you know, is this a good quality protein powder? There are some that have gone through rigor rigorous um, testing to ensure, hey, this is a good quality product. Hormone wise, do, do they contain hormones? They shouldn't um, if they are of a good quality. And I would, again, I, I think that this would be a great question to work on one-on-one -on -one with, you know, a dietitian, we can review products, give you feedback, let you know, is that particular product third-party tested? I really like Garden of Life um, protein powder. Orgain can be another good option. And with protein powders, you know, our approach typically is food first. Can we get protein from food sources first? Um, we know that those whole foods have less of a chance of having any extra additives in them, things like that. But there are time where there are times where including um, protein powders can be really beneficial. And if I uh, the question around do I recommend vegan or collagen protein powders? Um, I think it, again, really depends on the situation. If you are very focused on plant-based vegan can be a supportive option, but whey protein does provide a really good quality source of, um, the amino acids and what you need for exercise. Collagen is not quite on the level of, um, of like a whey protein powder or even a vegan protein powder. They don't have all the amino acids you may need for support there. Uh, but there have been uh, patients that I've worked with where I have suggested collagen because they have digestive issues or, you know, aren't responding well from a symptom standpoint when it comes to the collagen. I mean, when it comes to a vegan or whey protein powder and so it really is very specific, um, but whey and vegan would be a choice over collagen typically from a weight, uh, or, or sorry, from a muscle mass building and maintenance perspective. Um, how do you find an excellent dietitian? That's another great question because on this page, I have encouraged, you know, if you feel that you want to take this to the next level, it is ideal to work with a dietitian. I mean, of course, you know, I, I always love to share Genev. We work with, uh, individuals in menopause, but also women, I mean, people of any age 
who identify as women is really what we focus on. And we, again, meet you where you're at um, and really work to build rapport, relationship and accountability as you're on your journey. Um, and then to Ginger, she'll talk more, but she has, her company is Ginger Holton Nutrition and she works with patients one-on-one, -on -one, particularly related to cancer or other, uh, other conditions. And so two options right there, you know, from the get go. Um, and may, maybe Ginger has some other suggestions as well. Um, and then, okay. I think that's all the questions I see so far. But I, the one other thing I wanted to call out before I hand it over to Ginger is that, um, of course, you know, working with a dietitian can be so supportive, but there are, are, are also other support networks out there to consider. Cancer support groups. This may be with people who have also gone through cancer or have family who have gone through cancer. You don't have to, you know, have necessarily gone through it yourself to be affected or be concerned about this. And so there are, you know, if you meet with, or if you look at your local hospital system, oftentimes on their websites, they may list uh, different cancer support groups or how to find information about how to get connected there. Um, there are also comprehensive programs at cancer centers that are becoming more and more common. Um, teams of doctors, nurses, social workers, physical therapists, dietitians who all work together. So, you know, maybe nutrition you feel, you know, solid about, and it's not something that you feel like, oh, I need to solely focus on nutrition, but maybe it's, I'm having symptoms of lymphedema or something like that. And I need help from a physical therapist. Know that there are support. There is support out there um, with these other factors as well. And social workers can help you navigate a lot of, a lot of those things. Therapy work too. This is one that I should have included. I mean, we always want to think about our mental health and, and supporting that throughout this process. So in general, you know, we're wanting to support everyone with navigating care, whether that is walking through a cancer diagnosis and treatment, or just focusing on reducing risk in general for other, other reasons. So all right, I want to hand it over to Ginger now. Hey, Wendy, everyone. would you like to introduce um, Ginger? You bet. Um, so Ginger Holton, she has a Seattle-based uh, concierge practice. Again, we all work together at a genetics company. And I think that's important, right? Because people want to talk about their genetics, not only their genetics for breast cancer risk, but genetics for, you know, weight gain around the middle, what diet is best for you. And so Ginger and I have um, shared a lot of patients because, you know, we, we go through the genetics of things also. Um, she she tends to work she's she doesn't shy away from complex um cases and so you know we've both been in practice for quite a while and we you know have shared a lot of patients who have you know really sort of cases that aren't straight across the board um she also has written two books um one is the book that i showed you this anti-inflammatory diet meal prep I've given this book to a lot of people my kids like this this book it's really usable and then the other one i i failed to write um, the title, but something about how to beat disease with how you're eating. So I'll hand it over to Ginger and she can uh, tell you how to put all this into action. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm really excited to bring this all together. I just find myself like nodding my head vigorously to everything I'm hearing. I mean, this is like evidence-based, really practical information. Um, and Katie's right, dietitians are the ones that like, take the really good advice from your physician and then spend hours helping you implement. Somebody the other day was like, messaged me. They're like, I've never worked with a dietitian before. What is it like? And I said, well, it's kind of like a really long, in, like <laughs> long complex, like doctor's appointment where you're focused on nutrition, but it's kind of like therapy or counseling too, like all meshed up together. So it's like a really in-depth um, partnership. Uh, personally, you know, I have a private practice as a concierge private practice, and I work with people over a period of time, especially through cancer treatment or through health goals, because you need a relationship in order to make change. And I know that's how Wendy and Katie work too. But 
what, what I want to show you is Katie's amazing nutrition information, like that beautiful healthy plate and how I help my patients implement that. Because it's one thing to have the information, but the, it's the other thing to put it into your life and make it a habit. So when we're talking about breast cancer risk reduction, what you want to think about is the healthy recipes that you can make that's realistic for your life so that you're not in the kitchen all day, every day and making complex uh, recipes that, that maybe isn't a fit for you and your family. So the main thing that I try to do is hormone and energy balance by eating regular meals throughout the day and make it easy for you. And I like to say how people save time, money, and stress by menu planning, grocery shopping, and meal prep, but in a way that works for you. And another thing I've really enjoyed about the messaging today is, as you've noticed, we're talking about adding more foods in. How can you eat the rainbow more? How can you get more fiber, more plants? That's a really important aspect of how dietitians and naturopaths work. It's inclusive rather than restrictive. And that's a really important key message for all of you. So let's talk about the next page. And I have some more resources for you I'm excited about. So what I like to talk about when we're implementing this is planning, and then preparation. And a lot of my clients simply don't have healthy food in the house. They haven't gone grocery shopping. They're open their cupboards and they just feel like they don't have the options that they need. So the remedy for that is to just do a little bit of organization and planning so that it's realistic and you can get this into your life. And if you've got kids or a partner that like are complaining or you feel like you're constantly making many different meals or you're frustrated by that, I say get them involved. Have them pick out some recipes they want. Get them in the kitchen too. My book Books are very specifically written for simplicity. And I hear actually a lot of feedback that, oh, my teens can help me prep this. My partner that doesn't really know how to cook can make this. So that's really the, the lens that I'm coming from is like, how can we make this accessible and simple? So let's just take a, a simple example that actually can make a big difference in your health uh, for reducing breast cancer risk, um, eating more fruits and veggies. How many people want to do that? Me, most of us need to be doing this. Um, I'm constantly working on it, but it's one thing to say you want to do it and another thing to put it into action. You know, the easiest thing, the thing right in front of you is usually what happens. So we need to make the healthy thing the easy thing. What I like to do is plan meals and snacks that include fruits and veggies. Um, get creative. Your kids don't like veggies, bring them to the store, have them pick some out. There's a lot of evidence that shows that when people feel more involved in the, in the cooking process, they're more likely to try these foods. So get the family involved, get the foods on your grocery list. Like for example, I it's apple season, especially here in Washington state. So I just go and I get five apples a week for myself and five for my husband. And I know that I need 10 apples. So it's just a little bit about like, how much do you need? How do you get it in the house? Um, and one thing that I hear over and over and over, I'd say a hundred percent of the time is if you prep your veggies and fruits, like they're all lined up, they're ready to go, they're washed, they're sliced they're flying out of the refrigerator. A lot of my clients are so frustrated because they're like, my kids keep taking all the veggies. I hear it constantly. So definitely family members, but yourself too. If it's easy and it's right there for you, you're much more likely to, to eat it. And that really helps you save food waste and money too. So when you're, when you're ready to move into the action phase and you know what you're gonna be eating and you know how much you need and you went grocery shopping, I really like to just have people set aside a little bit of time. I had a client that came to me and she's like, I'm spending six hours every Sunday in the kitchen. And I was like, no, we need to reduce that. And I worked with her and we got it down to, to like one or two max. And then she was ready for the week. So really we need to be streamlining and using time correctly. But honestly, prepping fruits and veggies is one of the most powerful things you can do to help get the healthy veggies that you want to eat and the healthy fruits into your body where they need to be doing the fiber work and the nutrient work and get you all those healthy antioxidants. And that is how you start to implement anti-inflammatory in a way that is really realistic. So let me show you something on the next page here. I have some resources for you and I'm excited to walk through this. Um, this changed for me in the pandemic. It was one of those silver linings. I started to plan out my week and go grocery shopping once. And I've stuck with that. And it's something that I actually recommend for my clients very often, whether you're doing an order or you're ordering ahead and picking up or you're actually going yourself. I live in the city. Um, it's hard to get to the grocery store. A lot of my clients live in a really rural area. That makes it hard too. 
so what I like to do is I like to take a week long approach. I like to think about how can I reuse ingredients? You know, I don't like to make seven different breakfasts, seven different lunches and seven different dinners. That's just not realistic. I like to think about like one or two breakfasts for the week, some snacks that I can rotate in. I like to think about, you know, looping up dinner leftovers for lunch or having like every other day, like reusing things. Um, I have half an onion in my fridge right now. I'm going to reuse that, you know, but I like planned it out that way for my week. And again, reducing food waste and really reducing um, cost of groceries too, because that's, that's on the rise. So the most important thing is plan ahead, shop like once or twice a week instead of running to the store constantly, because I just want you to have what you need on hand. And then reuse those foods, keep it real simple throughout the week. And some of my clients are like, I don't care about variety. I just want to eat the same thing all the time. Cool. Other people are like, I really need variety and I need to eat different things all the time. And that's totally possible too. So when I'm working with people, I'm talking about like, what do you need? How are we going to implement that in your life? But I do recommend planning ahead, grocery shopping once or twice if possible, and just reusing those foods and, and keeping it really simple for you and your family. So let's move to the next. I wanted to show you um, some resources that I have. If you pop over to my website, gingerholtonnutrition.com, um, it'll be a little pop-up you can get on my newsletter. And my newsletter is really fun. I do like videos and I send like links to books and my favorite nutrition podcasts. And it's a really fun community over there. But I have downloadable information for you for free. So I have this weekly meal plan so that you can like sketch out what am I eating? What am I making? What recipes are gonna, am I going to use? And I also have a sample anti-inflammatory shopping list. And this is like very much what Katie was talking about. You'll see your whole foods uh, soy on here. You'll see all your fruits and veggies. You'll see herbs and spices. And that's sort of the foundation of um, anti-inflammatory meal plan. You'll see dairy, non-dairy. Um, and then of course you can make it your own. But I really like to give people a foundational idea of like how does your grocery shopping list reflect onto your plate and how do you plan ahead so that you, you feel like you're not overwhelmed in the grocery store? So definitely pop over to my site and grab those. And I hope that you guys will all um, stay connected to me because I love talking about nutrition on all the social media platforms. Um, let's move on here. So yeah, actually, I wanted to show you some very real examples of recipes that I do and how I bring this to life for my clients. So I just wanted to talk you through like a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, these kind of recipes are in my books. They're on my website. So lots of different options and access for you. But, you know, one thing I love to do, especially this time of year, would be like overnight oats recipe. So if you've never had overnight oats, it's like something that you can prep the night before or days before and you can have a real easy breakfast. You can have it in the car. You can have it at the office. You can have it when you're like drinking coffee and getting ready for the day. Um, but what you do is whole oats. And those are really powerful um, high fiber carbohydrates, really good fuel for the brain, lots of um it's unique antioxidants, actually. And then I love to do chia and flax. Those have those natural like plant antioxidants, plant estrogens that are so helpful for the menopausal symptoms for breast cancer risk reduction. And then I love to do fruit, but also right now do pumpkin. You know, I think we should do like something seasonal for sure. I'm forever using canned pumpkin and everything. Um, and then I love to do any time I can add herbs and spices, I do. So cinnamon, ginger, vanilla, bring, bring it in. Oh, I love that people love pumpkin. I love pumpkin. And then I'm boosting up the protein too. Cause what I hear a lot is like, well, if I only eat carbs and I don't have any fat or protein, then I'm, I'm hungry. So the way that I fix that is like balance your carbohydrates, which are so healthy for you with some fat and protein. And that'll keep you uh, really full longer and more balanced with your hormones and blood sugar. Um, you know, I feel like oats need a little bit of sweetness. So I love to do just like a drop of honey, a drop of maple syrup. Those are added sweeteners for sure. I want to acknowledge that. If you don't want to do any added sugar, you could do like some monk fruit or stevia, or you could just sweeten it with banana or fruit. And that's an option too. So that is like a breakfast that I would do, but let me talk about lunch and I wanna make sure we wrap up by nine and maybe have time for a few questions. I'm keeping an eye on the chat, so drop them for me. Um, I get a lot of questions about how to make tofu taste good. Does anybody need some inspiration there? 
tofu is such an amazing food, you guys. It is really rich in protein. It's really rich in calcium. So when we're talking about, you know, Wendy's like, hey, let's think about cardiovascular. Let's think about bone health. Tofu really has far reaching benefits. A lot of people just don't know what to do with it. So I buy the extra firm kind. You can so easily just like throw everything onto a sheet pan and it's hands off. So then you're doing something else. You're doing homework with the kids. You're doing like a walk, you know, a, a fitness in your house or just like taking a moment for yourself and you're not like in the kitchen. So if you have this stuff pre-chopped, you can throw it all on the, on the sheet pan, pop it in. And then actually here, I just have a really simple, um, how you make your own uh, so uh, soy sauce or uh, teriyaki sauce, or literally you can buy it also. Like that is definitely an option. And I do that sometimes too, but sheet pans are a really, really great way to do hands-off cooking, especially if your veggies are prepped. So let me show you one more. And I did see a question come in about the oatmeal. Um, you don't cook it. Isn't that amazing? The way that it gets soft and digestible is because it soaks overnight. It's overnight oats in the milk and the yogurt. So yeah, sometimes in the morning, some people eat it cold. I like to heat it up, but I just like literally microwave it for a minute. Like it's so simple. Um, my minestrone soup is one of my top recipes. It's in the anti-inflammatory uh, nutrition book. But, and I know that it's it's kind of small here, but I just really wanted to show you, you know, this is plant-based, beans, veggies, it stores well, it freezes well, you can make a big batch, it's easy, it uses pantry ingredients, staples like beans, for example, or uh, high fiber um, pasta. So I am making this like probably every other week at this point, it's just so delicious and you kind of kind of mix it up based on the veggies that you have. So those, that's like an example of how I would do a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then this will have amazing leftovers that you can have for days later. And also like the minestrone is something that you can freeze. The tofu doesn't freeze as well, to be fair. Um, I think my last, my next slide is my last. So I just wanted to highlight some breast cancer resources I have for you. I have two cookbooks, the Anti-Inflammatory Diet Meal Prep, and also that Eat to Beat Disease cookbook. Um, Dr. William Lee wrote a best-selling book called Eat to Beat Disease. It's really interesting. So if you're into like cellular health and protecting your DNA, this is like the compliment, like, how do you do that? <laughs> how do I cook? do that. And it's a little bit less plant based. It's got a, a chicken and fish recipe. So if that's for you, I have online anti-inflammatory programs. I have eBooks too about eating more plant-based and how to make that realistic and also how to do weight management in a non-restrictive way, like Katie was talking about. So how do you find an amazing dietitian? You've got a couple right here. Also, it's you can search dietitians in your area, especially I work virtually. So if you want to see someone in person, final plug, it's a incredibly important to have someone that is a registered dietitian that is a credential that tells you that somebody is qualified has a degree in nutrition has ongoing continuing education and will protect you with evidence-based information All right. And I hope you guys will stop over there and I'm on every social media channel and I hope that I'll see you on my newsletter and in my Instagram. And then I'll um, kick it over to Wendy. I know we've been taking questions throughout. Um, this has been really, really fun. Yeah, thanks. So I know this is a really tough topic to be, you know, discussing at eight o'clock in the morning, but I think our goal today was to share information with you on how to screen and what what are the most appropriate ways um, for you and to know what your risk factors are to use those calculators. And then it usually, you know, if we think about, you know, people are fearful of, you know, genetics, again, it's like maybe 10% genetics and 90% lifestyle. And so I think that, you know, Katie, Ginger, myself, we spend our lives basically working with patients to help them navigate their risks um for what disease and also you know not even that just to focus on the things that they need to focus on and then helping them figure out what does your diet look like how do you do that how do you prep what type of exercise do you do you got to schedule that in and you know and yes ginger and i will go meet sometimes and we'll have a scone and that's okay because if you're entirely restrictive then you're going to be bingy. And so i think we need to forgive ourselves for being human and wanting to enjoy a scone sometimes <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you know, being healthy does take work. Um, 
And so our goal is to help simplify because there's so much misinformation out there also. Well, I want to thank each of you, Ginger, Wendy, and Katie. This has just been fabulous. And it's information that we all need to know, like you said, Wendy. And there's so many resources that were mentioned today. We'll make sure and get those out into an email for all of you. And we want to thank you so much. This was terrific and a wonderful way to celebrate Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking this time. And for all of you who joined us today, please share this information um, with your friends, with your girlfriends, with your mom, with your aunt. And, you know, to have them maybe go and watch this afterwards because it's filled with so much credible information. So thank you so much.